Good evening, everyone. Please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Fair warning, there aren't, as, there aren't any scriptures on the PowerPoint tonight. Since we're getting back to normal, let's get back to normal. A little bit at a time. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23 is where we're going to start tonight. Thinking about the idea of taking up our cross one day at a time. This passage we're going to look at in Luke chapter 9 verses 23 and 24 is familiar to a fault. It's familiar to a fault because taking up a cross is a theme. It's something that happens and is said often in religious circles and in religious times. And yet in 21st century America, taking up our cross, we might put on a necklace or put on a bracelet or have something on our social media. But when Jesus said this, when he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to, ser to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. This idea of taking up a cross, well, it, it, it's, it's come into common vernacular that says, well, I'm not talking about mine. Well, your mother-in-law is just the cross you have to bear. Right? And you all are giggling now, not because of the mother-in-law, hopefully not because of the mother-in-law statement. But we often use the idea of a cross to bear as something that's a burden. Most of the time, we are talking about a hardship. A hardship that we don't think we should face. What does it mean to take up our cross daily? In view of how it's normally used, is it really just a normal? I don't have a hardship with my mother-in-law. She's always looked at me as though I'm weird because she raised two daughters and along comes this loud mouthed kid from Kentucky into the family. And she's never known what to do with me. You can ask Cindy. She's never known what to do with me. And she didn't know what to do with our boys either. I caught her one time just going when Josh and Philip were, were coming in because they were rambunctious boys, and she just wasn't used to boys. But was that really, was it a hardship on her? No. Was it a hardship on me? No. And is Jesus actually talking about something like that, like people? Are people a cross we have to bear? Unlike Jesus, who took up the cross for everyone and everyone's sins, he says, you and I, as disciples, must deny ourselves and take up our cross. Let's look past the modern... I don't really think it's meant to be flippant. I don't think somebody said that the first time and thought I want to be disrespectful to Jesus. But let's get past this modern idea of taking up our cross as some burden that we bear. And let's actually think about Jesus taking up His cross. Because everybody, everybody in, in, when Jesus said this, knew exactly what was going to happen. When someone took up their cross, it wasn't just a burden, even though it was a burden. What can you hear? Do you hear the people hissing at him? Do you hear the Roman soldiers hollering at him? Hurry up. Let's go. What do you see? Do you see Jesus pleading like in, in the Gospel of Luke? Daughters of Jerusalem, don't be crying for me. And the gist of that saying was, if you think it's bad now, in the green wood, imagine what's going to happen when the wood dries out. What can you see is someone bloodied and beaten with a large cross hanging across him. And what as Christians we see is someone who shouldn't have to do that. So is it merely a burden to bear? No, of course not. It's not merely a trouble to endure. It's not a burden to bear. Taking up a cross meant that person was guilty in the first century. And as a Christian, 
as much as we might not want to proclaim our guilt, taking up our cross means exactly that. We take up the guilt and we take up ownership of who we are. But it also meant losing personal control. Turn with me to John chapter 21. Someone told me a long time ago, Mark, I can, you know, after you get through preaching, I can hear that you can't keep your Bible studies from your morning sermons, from your PM sermons out of all, and it's just some kind of, they all mingle together. Well, this morning we talked in John 21 about Peter, but I want to read specifically in verses 18 and 19, John 21, 18 and 19, what Jesus says to Peter about how he's going to die. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And John says in verse 19, This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying that, he said to him, Follow me. Taking up the cross in John 21 meant you're not in control. Not in control of your destiny. Not in control of your life. And it also meant, of course, certain death. The fellow who was carrying his cross, and it wasn't just Jesus who carried crosses. I'm sure the two thieves that day carried their cross. Other people who went to their crucifixions carried their cross. They were carrying the implement of their own demise, their own torturous demise. And then, as Christians, we hear in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, you must be a living sacrifice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves as a living sacrifice. Do you hear? It's not somebody else presenting you for somebody else. You present yourself as a living sacrifice. When we hear taking up the cross, we ought to think about doing it by ourselves. It's not someone holding a gun to our head. It's not somebody doing it for us. It's not, it's not doing it out of some compunction. We're doing it because we want to, which is exactly what Jesus is telling us in Luke 9. You do it because this is something that you have determined to do. This isn't just a burden. This is an act of faith. When we hear taking up our cross, we ought to hear Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Now, we're not, we're not going to take the time to read these seven verses, but you know, if you've studied your Bible for very long, you know in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, it talks about being baptized. We have died to sin and been raised to walk in newness of life, which is a microcosm of the gospel story. It's a microcosm of what Jesus went through. He says when you take up your cross, you're dying to sin. Luke 9, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We're born again in Romans chapter 6. Born again as a citizen in the kingdom of God. And then Ephesians chapter 4, the idea of denying ourselves. He talks here about putting off our old selves and being renewed again. You see... The idea of taking up our cross, the idea of being baptized, isn't something that somebody else can do for us. It's perhaps the most important personal decision we ever make. Which is why somebody else can't do it for us. It makes no sense that somebody could do it for us. But in Ephesians chapter 4, that idea of being renewed, about putting off our old selves... And being renewed. And in Colossians chapter 3, we're going to look specifically. Let's take, like, take the time and read in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to go back to the beginning of the chapter. Colossians chapter 3, we'll start reading in verse 1. And since I'm not putting the scriptures up, I'll actually give you some time to flip there, punch there, whatever it is that I haven't been doing for the last 15 months. Colossians chapter 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek, these, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you also once walked when you lived in them. But now you must also put off all of these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created it. Now when we hear take up our cross, put to death the things of the earth. Put to death the things like fornication and covetousness. Because we've died with Christ. Because you see, it's not just enduring a common trial. It's not having to put up with people. It means recognizing and admitting how, our, how guilty we are. It means putting that part of ourselves that we know is wrong to death. Not just kind of dealing with it, but putting it to death. Whether it's cheating or stealing or wrath or resentment or gossip or bitterness, whatever it is, Whatever that thing that haunts us that we're tempted with, whatever it is, when we take up our cross, we're supposed to put it to death. It means dying to our faults, dying to our defects, dying to our sins, dying to the things that have tempted us and not longing for them. Because what we know about all of that sin is that's why Christ died. And we may, we may be tempted to think that our little faults, our little things that we struggle with aren't that important. It's not that big of a deal. After all, we're only human. That's not found in Scripture. What we're told by the power of God working through us and through the gospel, what happens is that when we die to sin, when we take up our cross, it's not always supposed to be easy. Do you remember when I asked you what did you see and what did you hear? Does that picture in any of the Gospels sound easy as he's bearing his cross out to Calvary's hill? Not only was it painfully obvious to everyone how much of a struggle it was for our Lord to physically carry his cross the idea of carrying our sins was just as much of a burden. It's a sacrifice. And what we can't do is to try to make it easy for somebody to become a Christian. Because that's there is a cost involved to discipleship. If we make it so easy and we make it painless, then there's no true conversion. We become religious rather than saved. But crucify ourselves we must. Crucify our problems. We must take up our cross. And as Luke said, we must take up our cross daily. We don't get to take up our cross once and be done with it. Oh, I did it once, I'm good. You know, that stupid, almost meme kind of an idea. Yeah, I told my girl I loved her once, and if I changed my mind, I told her I'd let her know. That's not, we, this is a day by day, day by day, every morning when we face a new day, we pick up our cross, or at least we should be thinking that way. We should be picking up our cross and renewing our commitment. And still, because if we've ever been a Christian for very long, and if we're going to be completely honest and forthright with God and with ourselves, we know that every day we have to deal with things. Every day. If our Lord had to deal with the temptation to not to want to die on the cross, we're not being honest with ourselves and we're not being transparent about our own heart when we think, yeah, I'm good. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul ascribes to us a truth that we need to understand. Now, oftentimes, we reject the Calvinistic idea of total, total depravity, and rightfully so. But the problem isn't, our problem isn't with Adam and Eve. Our problem is with ourselves. 
among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and here, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. You see, it's not somebody else's fault that I have become a, children of, a child of wrath. It's not somebody else's fault that I have sinned. It's not somebody else's fault that I am prone to weakness and temptation. It's my fault. But it has become such a part of me that I need God to get rid of it. This isn't some kind of 12-step thing that I can control what I can control. You know what we can control? Almost nothing. Because what we can control is of the flesh. And what we need to overcome is the power of God and the Spirit in our lives and the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us, which is the whole point of the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. In Romans chapter 6, instead of being enslaved to sin, Paul says now you have become a servant or a slave to God. That kind of bondage and enslavement of getting rid of our being enslaved to sin doesn't happen because the preacher says a couple of things. We are baptized, and all of a sudden, hey, everything's great. Well, it is great, but it doesn't mean the battle's over. If Jesus had to learn what it meant to be obedient by the things which He suffered, we don't learn obedience and become perfect and become great by coming to church once or twice. By hearing a gospel sermon. We are absolutely naive if we think that we can make a momentary decision and suddenly never again struggle with temptation. That may be some religion, but it's not the true religion of Jesus Christ. The way we overcome is to take up our cross daily. And what this brings to light is three very practical things I want us to think about here as we get close to the close. This means if we have a great day cross-bearing. If we had a great day cross-bearing yesterday, we don't get to think that we've accomplished anything for tomorrow. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, Beware lest anyone who thinks he stands, because he will fall. It's not a one-time event. It's not a one-time event standing. It's not a one-time event falling. This is a daily measure, and it's probably even more of a subset than that. This is, this is an hourly thing. What we have to deal with the way that we think. We have to deal with what we long for. Taking up our cross daily means on a practical level, if I had a good day yesterday, a good day, had a good day at worship, someone encouraged me. Had a good day because I got to help a brother or sister. Got baptized. Got married. Got, I had a good day yesterday in the service of God. Past performance does not equate to future performance. What we have to do every day, according to Luke 9 and 20, 23 and 24, is we take up our cross daily. Now, that may not seem real happy. Let's talk about a happier one. We may not rest on yesterday's victories, but we don't have to quit because of yesterday's failures either. When we fail, and what, what we hear in the gospel is, not only have we failed in the past, we may be prone to fail in the future, just like the disciples, just like the Christians in all of the epistles. Our failures don't define us yesterday. So what we can do is pray for forgiveness, ask God to help us. Since we're His children, we don't have to dwell on all of the failures of the past, either ours or someone else's that we know about. Because that'd be easy. Because you, you know, if you, if, you, if you push, if you think about everybody else's failures, you know what you get to do with yours? Not think about them. But praise be to God that when we take up the cross, it's not only denying ourselves, it's not only understanding that, but it's also the vehicle by which our sins are forgiven. So when we take up that cross, our sins are forgiven, no matter what has happened. 
which is why we put our confidence in the Lord. We don't put our confidence in the flesh. We don't put our confidence, I'm a good person. I've been a good person. I've, you know, I used to be around, I've, I've been around some preachers in the past who talked about the number of people that they've baptized as if that gets them closer to heaven. How many gospel meetings they've had. Or folks about how often I come to church or how much I give. You know, there, there, is, there is a temptation to think about all the good that we have done. We don't, we don't, get, we don't get to add up all our good. Because you know what our good added up gets us? No closer to heaven without Jesus. But if we also add up all the bad, and we take up our cross daily, that means that we are closer to heaven today than we were yesterday when we failed. If we foundered yesterday, we can pick up our cross because God is faithful. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 ought to be a passage that's underlined or highlighted in, in our cell phones. God is faithful. What is He faithful at? He's faithful at forgiving His people. He doesn't long for us to be damned. He doesn't long for us to be in eternal damnation. He, lo he doesn't long for us to go to hell. He longs for us and He will be faithful to us that if we confess our sins, He will forgive them. And folks, he's saying that to Christians. 1 John isn't written into, into the world. It's written to folks who come to worship. We can't do anything about our failures in the past, but God can. But what we can do today is confess our sins and pick up our cross again today. And we can do right by God. And we can keep doing it one day at a time. Every day. You don't take up your cross for a lifetime all at once. I've used this analogy and I'm going to keep using this analogy because the first time that we went to the Smoky Mountains, and I'm, I'm sure none of you know that I have an affinity for going to the Smokies. But the first trail I ever went on was a six and a half mile trail that gained 4,000 feet in elevation. And I'd been drinking sweet tea and eating fried fish almost all summer long because Long John Silver's was around the mall. And I, you know, hey, $2.99, that's a good deal. $2.99 might get you a Coke now, I don't know. But even at 24 years old, I went like that. I mean, I'm going up there. <laughs> and I'm like, no, really, we're going up there. And here we go. And guess how, guess how I got up there? One step at a time. Yes, this fat man who wasn't quite as fat then actually made it up to the top of that mountain, up the Rainbow Falls Trail. And it was the worst, best thing that I had done to that point physically. But the only way you get to the top of a mountain is one step at a time without quitting. We don't take up our cross for 10 years at a time. We don't take up our cross one month at a time, one week at a time. We take up our cross one day at a time. And we don't have to be overwhelmed by how I'm going to get to there. Because we get to there not by being overwhelmed by how far we have to go, we get there by being overwhelmed at the love and the grace of God that has enabled us to actually take it up and do something. That He loves us enough to keep doing it. For the joy that is set before us. We only have to think about today. You remember what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 6? Sufficient is the day for its troubles. So when we start worrying about years from now, decades from now, What's it going to be like when my grandchildren grow up? Grandparents, have you thought about that? I don't know, I don't know what this old world's going to be like when my grandchildren grow up. Sufficient is the day for its trouble, one day at a time. Because you know what? People survived in Corinth by taking up their cross one day at a time. People have survived in the United States of America as children of God one day at a time. By taking up our cross, it means we'll still be bearing our cross tomorrow, God willing. Next week, we'll still be bearing our cross. Next month, we'll still, we'll still be bearing our cross. In other words, we're in this for the long haul. 
This is, this is not a sprint. The Hebrew writer says that we have need of endurance. This idea of endurance is something, there's no day coming in life as a, as a Christian, as a disciple, when we get to take a day off from being a child of God. That's not how it works. Turn with me back to Luke chapter 4. Now some more bad news. In Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4 and verse 13, hear what the devil was doing after he failed with Jesus the first time. Luke chapter 4 and verse 13, Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Did the devil give up on tempting the Lord? No. What does Peter call him in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8? He calls him a roaring lion. What does he want to do? He wants to ruin us. He wants to destroy us. There will never be a time, brothers and sisters, when we are impervious to temptation. Because at the point that we say, I'm impervious to temptation, we fail. Because humility is out the door and the trusting in God for our salvation is out. They wouldn't be temptations if we were impervious to them. Which is the foolish idea that Jesus couldn't have sinned. A temptation is not a temptation if you can't fail. A test isn't a test if you can't fail. But Jesus endured. So don't be surprised when you've been a Christian for 10, 20, 40, 50 years when you realize that every day you still have to pick up your cross and follow the Lord. And if you fail, don't think of yourself as a complete failure because you're only a failure as a child of God when you quit. So don't. Put Christ on again every morning. Take up His cross and do as He says. Fight the battles that we can with the overcoming grace of God that allows us to win. We're, we're not failing until we quit. We're not failing until we don't do what Jesus has asked us to do. Cross-bearing, there's a paradox here. Because when we think of the cross, we think of this terrible, this terrible scene. When because of being enslaved to sin, our Lord took our burdens on Him. But the paradox of the cross-bearing is, the only way to get to where we want to go is through the cross. There's no escape around it, and it's a paradox. It seems... Because he says, in back, back where we started in Luke chapter 9, in verse 24, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Unless you trust in Jesus. Because what he was willing to give up for us to enable us to have eternal, he gave up heaven. He gave up his life. And in some way, we have to give ourselves up. We have to die to sin. We have to be willing to die daily to sin in order to get and to be with who we want to be with in eternity. We're actively putting ourselves to death daily. Whoever would save his life will lose it. If we fight to hold on to the things of this, of this flesh, if we fight to hold on to the things of this life, we really are then, Solomon, punching the air. Because we're, we're going to try to hold on to something that we think, that we think is so very important. I'm going to try to hold on here. And what did Jesus give up? The one thing that we are aiming for, being in the presence of God for an eternity, Jesus gave that up. In Philippians chapter 2, He didn't consider being God something to hold on to, which, is, which expresses the divine nature better than anything else. Because you see in the flesh we try to hold on. We hold on to our passions, we hold on to our lusts, we hold on to desires, we hold on to everything in every way and thinking, this is the best of life. I got what I want. And it's not until we give it all up that we get anything of any significance at all. 
It's only when we submit ourselves to Christ in this way and do it every day that we can truly have our best life. And our best life is not the accumulation of things. Our best life is not trying to find a loophole, trying to find a way around. We can argue and say, well, but this won't hurt me. This, it's not too much to ask if I get... Making the cross lighter for me or someone else doesn't help us get closer to heaven. In fact, it makes it farther away. And all we're doing when we try to finagle away around the cross is we're ensuring our own death if we don't change. Or we're helping someone else make it easier for them to die spiritually and die a second death. True life, eternal life, only comes by giving up our life and picking up our cross to be crucified with the Lord. So what are you taking up tonight? Are you willing to take up a cross? Or are you willing to take up the resentments, the bitterness, the lusts, the things of the flesh that seem to be sweet, like vengeance, slander, power? We take those things up and we can. Satan wants us to think that we can hang on to those and that'll be fine. But that's not how it works. What we'll have if we take all those things up is guilt and shame and bitterness and death. If we hold on to those things, you can't have the world and Jesus too. We have to choose one or the other. The cross is the only way to any real freedom, to any real peace, to any real life of any significance. And that is the gospel call. When Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, there was some strength to that sentence that sometimes gets lost. It doesn't get lost in the translation. It gets lost in the many, many, many times we misuse it. Like, well, that's just the burden I've got to bear. Praise be to God that Jesus bore the burden that you and I couldn't. He paid a debt that we couldn't pay ourselves because, like the invitation song this morning, His mercy is more. And if you're willing to cry out for that mercy tonight, if you're willing to take up your cross and live from now on in the grace and the goodness of God,